Okay, so why would anyone try to attack printers? Why does it matter to you actually? Well, printers are pretty much everywhere. They're contained in every household, in every business, in every educational institution. And they have access to sensitive information like business contracts still being printed, like yet unpublished research or exams to be held maybe. And today I'm going to show you how incredibly easy it is to access this information based on vulnerabilities that are present in almost any laser printer since 35 years. And apart from attacking the printer directly to obtain sensitive information, it may be interesting from an attacker's point of view to use the printer device to escalate herself into the company's network. So the printer may be the weakest link in your IT security chain. Definitely it's worse to have a deeper look at those devices. Okay, undoubtedly printers have evolved. 30 years ago we had simple mechanical devices that did nothing but print or produce a paper jam from time to time. Nowadays you cannot buy a printer without actually buying a full-blown computer system with a TCP IP stack, advanced operating systems, usually with uh, advanced functionalities such as a fax and scanning. You even have package management on many newer printers because you can install printer apps and other fancy stuff. The only thing that hasn't changed is that always when you're in a hurry and you want to print, the device will produce a paper jam. Okay, now you may argue, well, um, all our devices are getting smart or not so smart. Um, what is so special about printers? Well, in addition to all the generic security problems that we have with embedded devices, in the printing world, there are some securities, um, some, some weaknesses um, by design. For example, you can access the printer's memory using ordinary print shops. You can access the printer's file system through ordinary print shops. Even firmware updates are deployed as ordinary print shops. So there is no distinction between administrative functionality and printing a document. In other words, you have got data and code over the same channel and we know that this is always a bad idea. And this security weakness is shared by all laser printers. Okay, what are our main uh, contrib contributions? Well, we performed the systematization of um, uh, network printer attacks. Um, some of them are well known, um, some, some of them are novel attacks. Um, and we evaluated them on 20 printer models of um, uh, various uh, different manufacturers using a Python tool, the Printer Exploitation Toolkit, Brad, that you can use to pen test printers. And we showed some novel attack beyond traditional printers and some new research directions. So let me give you an outline of today's talk. First, I need to give you some background information on printing technologies so you will get a better understanding um, of the attacks to follow. Then I will give an evaluation of the attacks and an introduction to our um, bread software and to show how to attack um, areas um, beyond traditional printers like for example uh, websites that interpret PostScript. And I'm going to show you some countermeasures so you can protect your devices. Okay, let's start with some background information. Well, what does it actually mean to print? It means two things. First of all, you need to select um, a printing channel, like for example, uh, using a USB cable or using one of various network printing protocols. And the second thing is you need to select a printer language, a language that is directly understood by the printing device. Basically, uh, PGL and PostScript are two languages that are supported by almost any laser printer. And what your printer driver actually does is it translates the document to be printed into a language that is understood by the printer and uses the printing channel to send the document there, for example, using PostScript. 
Okay, what are we going to attack in this talk? What can you attack in the printing area? Well, a printer typically contains some kind of mechanical printing unit. We don't really care about that. Some kind of printer language interpreters, like a PGL interpreter, a PostScript interpreter, or various other uh, printing language interpreters like PCL or direct PDF printing or lots of proprietary languages. We do not care about them in this talk. And when you want to print, for example, using USB cable, actually what uh, happens is that you send, for example, um, PostScript data to the USB port. It's interpreted by the PostScript interpreter and finally put to paper by the printing unit. And you can also use lots of other channels, for example, raw network printing over port 9100. The interesting thing here is that, um, like USB, you get a bidirectional channel over the network and can directly talk to the interpreter, for example, to the PostScript interpreter, so you get a direct feedback from the device. But there are many other printing protocols that are directly supported by most uh, network printers, like the internet printing protocol, like a line printing uh, daemon, uh, an old protocol known from the uh, Unix world, or um, server message block, which is uh, known as um, printer shares in the Windows world. What the important takeaway here is that we do not attack the channels, we attack the interpreters. So the attacks are independent of the actual channel that deploys the payload, the malicious document. In other words, whenever you can print, somehow you can attack the printer. Okay? Well, um, now let me give you a short introduction to PGL and PostScript, because that's the languages we are going to attack. PGL, the printer job language, is, um, was developed by HP in the early 90s. It has become a de facto standard for print shop control. And what can you do with PGL? For example, you can manage settings like uh, setting the paper size to A4 and setting the number of copies before switching the interpreter to uh, the actual page description language, which contains the document, um, the actual document to be interpreted, for example, in the PostScript language. The interesting thing here is that PGL is not limited to the current print shop. This means you can uh, make changes permanent and can therefore influence further print shops. And there are some other um, features um, within the standard of PGL. For example, you can access the file system of the printer using PGL, so using um, an ordinary print shop, you can access the printer's file system. Second language is um, PostScript. PostScript was um, the very first product of um, Adobe in the early 90s. Some of us remember it as a format for document exchange. However, actually PostScript was designed for and is still heavily used in uh, laser printers. When you want to print a document, for example, a PDF file, what your printer drive does is it converts it to PostScript and sends it to the printer. Okay, the interesting thing here is that PostScript is not a simple page description language or markup language like HTML, for example. It is actually a Turing complete programming language. So, from the viewpoint of theoretical computer science, given access to a PostScript interpreter, you already have code execution in the sense that every possible program, every possible algorithm can be written in the PostScript language and executed on the printer. Okay, now let me come to the attacks. Um, our methodology for finding new attacks was pretty simple. We uh, simply studied the standards for PostScript and PGL and um, we search for features in the language that are critical from a security point of view and that can be abused um, for attacks. Before uh, giving an introduction to the actual attacks, I need to um, introduce three attacker models so you can see who can actually perform the attacks. Our first attacker model is an attacker with physical access to the device. You might say that's 
really quite a strong attacker model, of course. However, um, we think it may be realistic um, because ask yourself, is my department's copy room really always locked? Well, for us, this is not the case. And it's only a matter of seconds to sneak into the copy room and launch a malicious print job from USB stick, for example, and therefore permanently infect the printer with, for example, PostScript malware. Okay, so we think this may be a realistic scenario for many companies and institutions. Our next attacker model is the attacker with TCP IP network access to the device. Again, you may ask, well, who would connect his printer directly to the internet? Well, lots of people do. Um, the Showtime search engine for devices currently um, categorizes uh, 34,000 systems out there as uh, printers. Actually, it's a lot more. The categorization is not 100% uh, correct here. Um, but uh, if you're an attacker that just wants to randomly attack some device, uh, uh, you can use Shodan and alone in Germany there are more than 2,000 devices listed. Okay, um, how would the attacker uh, proceed? Well, uh, the attacker would use the internet to connect to port 9100 of the printer device. And as said, the interesting thing here is that the attacker gets a bidirectional channel, so she can also extract data, for example, stored print shops, um, directly to the network. Okay, um, what if there's uh, some kind of firewall, as it should be, um, or the printer does not have a public IP address? Well, um, another scenario to consider in this attacker model would be an insider. For example, um, consider um, a shared network printer that is shared by employees and by a department manager and one of the employees may have the motivation to read the print jobs of the <coughs> department manager. Um, so, and there's another scenario, um, the, um, the wireless attacker, for example, because most new printers support Wi-Fi by default, and all the attacker needs to do is run her own access point with a default SSID, and many printers will automatically connect to that access point. So even at an attacker that is not within the company's network can communicate with the device, can attack the device. Okay, our strongest, excuse me, our weakest attacker model is the uh, web attacker. Um, all she does is control the uh, content of a website that is visited by an employee within the same local area network than a printer. What actually happens is that um, the, uh, the website can um, execute JavaScript, uh, JavaScript code um, in the browser of the employee and therefore um, uh, cause the uh, connect to port 9100 of the printer and uh, launch malicious uh, PostScript code, for example. Okay, there's uh, one major drawback in this attacker model. Uh, there's no back channel. So the attacker can only send data but not receive any data. I will come back to this later. Okay, we have categorized the actual attacks into four classes. Denial of service attacks, so making printing functionality unavailable to other users. Um, protection bypass attacks, for example, by resetting the device to factory defaults. Manipulating the print shops of other users and information disclosure attacks uh, like, for example, uh, access to the file system, to the memory, or um, obtaining other users' print jobs. Okay, let me give you a short example for every class of attacks. Well, what always works in the denial of service context of attacks is the PostScript infinite loop. Um, as said, PostScript is actually a programming language, and you can use legitimate language constructs like loops, and what is single line of code sent to a printer actually does, it tells the printer to do nothing forever, and therefore uh, legitimate users need usually to turn the device um, off and on again to uh, be able to print again. Okay, that's pretty simple, um, but you may, one may say, whenever you uh, can print, you can simply prevent others from printing, okay? 
So um, bypassing protection mechanisms. Well, um, assume uh, you have got a system administrator and that guy does really a good job and he has uh, set passwords everywhere and uh, the attacker wants to change some settings in the printer but she doesn't know the password. If the attacker has physical access to the device, what she can always do is reset the printer to factory defaults. Well, that's a legitimate feature documented in the manuals of all models. Um, however, what is more interesting it is that on HP printers, for example, you can reset the device to factory defaults over a print job. So by sending this line of PGL code, you uh, will reset the printer and uh, reset it to factory defaults and therefore bypass all protection mechanisms like passwords uh, set by the, um, by the administrator. Okay, um, here's one of my favorite, um, manipulating other users' print shops. Well, how could you do that? One way to do it is to overwrite the show page operator in the PostScript programming language. Well, PostScript as a programming language consists of about 400 operators for stack manipulation, graphic manipulation, and so on. And one operator is the show page operator. It's contained on every page in every document to actually put that page on paper. And you can also practically override constructs of the PostScript language for subsequent print jobs. And therefore, the attacker can execute her own code when the, post, uh, when the show page operator is called. And therefore, use this to overlay, for example, arbitrary graphics. Let me give you a demo. Everybody likes demos. Hope it works. Okay, um, here's our Python tool, Brett. Um, it, um, if it's called without any arguments, uh, it will just uh, try to list uh, the printers in your local network. And let me just try to connect to our Mr. Printer here. In a PostScript mode, what actually happens now is that we are connecting to port 9100 of the network printer, and we get a Bedarvian shell, so we get direct results, and we have various uh, commands uh, you would expect from a Unix command line, for example, to access the, uh, the file system, for example, and here are the results for the file system. Uh, but what I wanted to do is actually uh, to do uh, some uh, print shop manipulation attacks. We can do this with the cross command, for example, select the font, and we can then say hacked. Now what we did is we infected the device uh, with a PostScript malware that stays in memory. And now a legitimate user comes by and he wants to print, for example, the, um, the ticket page of this conference. And what now happens is that the um, page is normally printed, but uh, at the end of the page, when the show page, or show page operator is called, our version is executed. And um, as you can see, it now says hacked. Okay? You may say, okay, that's just uh, a simple prank. Um, uh, can I do more with, uh, with overlaying, uh, with redefining the show page operator, for example? Well, there's much more. Um, be creative. You're in the context of a programming language. So you can also, for example, search for certain strings and replace the strings. For example, if you do not like some user and you want to introduce misspellings into the printouts of a certain user. Or think about a sales agreement that is going to be printed and you want to lower the price. Um, so here it may get ugly in the end. Okay. Now let me come to the uh, last class of attacks, information disclosure attacks. Um, as said, you can uh, access uh, the memory using proprietary PGL and PostScript commands. You can also access the file system, which is part of the standard of PostScript and PGL. But what I'm going to show you today is to capture print jobs. It's based on pretty much the same uh, idea that you hook into subsequent print jobs and you have control um, of uh, those jobs. In practice, it's not that easy. Um, for example, um, one of the problems that we were facing was um, where to actually store the print jobs. If you have uh, a hard disk and you can access the hard disk, you can simply store it there. Else you need to store the print job in memory, maybe compressed uh, as a PostScript variable or something like that. So then it gets um, a bit harder. 
Okay, let me again give you a demo. We are connecting to the uh, printer again. We are using the uh, capture command and we say capture start. Again, we are infecting the printer with uh, PostScript malware. And again, we are printing that conference page. The page is printed and then at the end of the day, the attacker comes back and collects all the print jobs that have been printed by the department, for example. We can use a capture list and we see, yes, there should be, yes, there's a print job and we can download it. And we can, in the end, open it with uh, every PostScript viewer, for example, with a ghost view in uh, Windows or with, um, with events in uh, Linux. Let me just do this. Oh, that's great. Okay, this demo didn't work. In theory, you could do that. Well, um, yeah. We may have uh, gotten only fragments of the PostScript code and uh, Therefore, we cannot uh, render it maybe in, uh, in events. Okay, well, um, there's some problem with all information disclosure attacks. Um, as said, the web attacker is not able to get a back channel from the device. Um, she can only send data, but she cannot receive any data. So why is this? You all know this. Um, it's because of the same origin policy. Um, let me give you a short example. We've got some website, it's evil.org, as it always is. We've got some uh, internal banking site that we want to um, attack. And uh, we have got an employee within the same uh, local area network um, than that uh, internal system that we can use as a carrier. So we, um, the attacker manages to, uh, to um, lure the uh, employee to her website and then can um, execute JavaScript in the um, employee's web browser and therefore, for example, um, uh, make an HTTP GET request uh, to some resource um, in the local area network. However, now evil.org does not equal internal.bank.com, same origin policy, so the browser says now evil.org is not allowed to access this resource. Okay. Now, however, in the context of printers, you can use some interesting feature. Of course, cross-origin resource sharing, uh, you all know that it's um, the possibility of a website to explicitly allow uh, a certain site to access a certain resource. Okay, um, now again, we have the setting of uh, evil.org and uh, some employee and a printer that is uh, going to be attacked this time. Again, uh, we lure the employee to our um, website and we can execute uh, JavaScript, JavaScript in the uh, context of that employee's browser. Now our, Java, our, Java, our JavaScript can trigger a post request to port 9100 of the printer, which contains PostScript. PostScript is executed by the printer. PostScript is a programming language. PostScript can contain echo statements and therefore uh, something's echoed back to the network socket. Okay, and therefore you can simulate an HTTP server running on that printer, including access control, allow origin, evil.org. So including the course uh, header entry to explicitly allow evil.org to access that resource. So this is now interpreted by the printer, echoed by the printer back to the network socket. And then again, the uh, browser thinks Oh yes, it's totally fine that evil.org is allowed to access this resource. The web attacker now has to, the possibility to perform all the information disclosure attacks uh, shown so far. A website can read your print jobs. Okay. Um, well, uh, Chrome and Firefox are currently in the uh, process of discussing to uh, block port 9100. The result is still unclear. Okay, now let me come to a short evaluation. Um, well, one problem was obtaining enough test devices. And we wanted to have an average of what is usually uh, used in a, in a typical university and office environment. 
And um, well, how would you do it? Well, what we actually did is we uh, knocked a lot of doors and wrote a lot of emails to finally contact the system administrators and asked if they wouldn't have test printers for us for signs um, to, to test the attacks. And that was pretty successful. We got uh, 20 devices in the end from eight different manufacturers. And uh, we installed the latest firmware to um, make sure um, found ones uh, would be really in a new firmware. OK, here's the um, evaluation results. On the left side, you can see the actual printer model. And on the right side, you can see the attack category denial of service. Red means the device is vulnerable. Um, as said, for example, the infinite loop with PostScript works for almost all devices. There are some other uh, things that you can do. You can redefine the show page operator to do nothing at all. Um, so uh, print jobs are still accepted and processed, but not put to paper anymore. PGL has a similar feature, so you can set the device to offline mode, so legitimate users are not able to um, access the device anymore to the network. And we were ab even able to physically damage 8 of 20 devices um, by exceeding the NVRAM's capability to accept new values. Now you need to know the NVRAM, which is uh, usually EEPROM or flash memory, physically only has the capability to accept uh, 100,000 or a million, at least some upper limit of write cycles. And long-term settings, like the number of copies, can be stored in the NVRAM. And they can be set with a single line of code in a print shop. And a print shop can also contain, a large print shop can contain a million of, uh, of uh, setting changes. And therefore, you can um, physically break the device's capability to accept new values um, and destroy the NVRAM using print shops only. OK, your device will still totally fine work. Um, and print, but for example, if you have got letter as a default format and you want, for example, to uh, set um, A4 as a paper size by default, um, you can't do that anymore and it may be problematic. Okay, next attack uh, category, bypassing protection mechanisms. Um, using SNMP, this worked for about half of the devices. It's the only attack that did not uh, work through print jobs. All other attacks are done directly through print jobs. But you can also reset devices to factory defaults as set on most HP devices through ordinary print shops. The um, print shop manipulations attack, like overlaying graphics or replacing content, works for most um, post um printers. Accessing the memory works for uh, Prada-based devices. Access to the file system only worked for two HP devices to access the whole file system. But on most devices, we could access certain directories. Now, this is not harmless because, for example, on OK devices, you have got a directory that is called hidden, and all the passwords and all the settings are stored there, and you have read and write access, for example, um, to the device password itself. But what may be more interesting is that you can integrate the device into a company's network. Um, for example, into a Windows domain, so you have an Active Directory password stored in a hidden directory. You have, um, for example, LDAP integration. You may have a scan to email and therefore email credentials stored on the printer. Um, there may even be um, IPsec or Wi-Fi pre-shared keys um, if the administrator sets them on the printer. And that may be a good example of how an attacker can escalate herself into a company's network using the printer as the weakest link, as the starting point. Okay, capturing print shops um, works uh, also on most devices. Um, um, Prada, for example, is the, the only one where it's problematic because they have a PostScript clone that is not really compatible with the PostScript standard, so we can't capture print shops there. And uh, credential disclosure attacks, so brute force attacks against PostScript and PGL, also work for most of the devices. OK, now let me give you a short introduction to Brett, our software tool. Um, if you do a pen test against printers, you can use Brett and you can use it to, um, to uh, hack your own printer. It's a free software available on GitHub. Well, uh, what does it do? If you want to test a printer, it accepts some Unix-like command like ls, 
which is processed by the attacker component, translated either to PGL or PostScript, and finally sent to the printer. Currently supported is port 9100 over network and USB cable. Okay, for example, you select PostScript mode, and then you do not speak to, need to speak PostScript. You just type ls, and Brett does the rest for you. Um, it uh, translates it to PostScript and fetches the PostScript re uh, response and displays the results in a user-friendly manner. And you can do pretty much the same with PGL. PGL request, get a PGL response, and again, um, get the uh, result of ls. Okay, there are um, many of the typical commands that you would expect from um, a Unix command line or a command line FTP client for file system access like ls, get, put, append, delete, download, upload files and so on. And, but there's much more um, uh, to discover, so this is only the commands for file system access. Okay, now we ask ourselves, um, can we adapt the attacks to areas beyond traditional printers? And with PGL, this is quite difficult because PGL is really tightly bound to printers and only used there. However, PostScript has use cases um, in other areas. For example, in desktop software, um, your Microsoft Word or your LibreOffice, they still allow you to import PostScript files and therefore execute PostScript files on your computer. And um, some websites even process PostScript. I will come to that, back to that later. Um, now, um, a simple example um, for um, Google Cloud Print. So, um, what is Google Cloud Print? Um, you can use it to print from anywhere in the world, and um, you just need to register a Cloud Print compatible printer. And what can you do? For example, you can attack the printer itself through Cloud Print. You, if the uh, printer is a PostScript printer, you can simply send a PostScript file given access to a Google user account, of course, which is not easy. Um, and then you can, you have yet another channel to, to attack the printer, okay? But what may be more interesting is that you can also try to attack the Google Cloud. Because if you register a printer that says, well, I don't like PostScript, my preferred language is, I'm a direct PDF printer, I only want PDF. And then you can uh, send a PostScript file to Google Cloud Print. Google Cloud Print translates it for you to PDF. And interesting thing is that this conversion of PostScript actually means interpreting, means executing PostScript. So um, PostScript is executed on the Google server, um, which may be problematic. However, the Google guys are pretty bright and they have pretty much sandboxed everything. And uh, the only thing that uh, we found, uh, what we were able to do in the end, was to stat files um, in, the, uh, in the file system. So a very limited information disclosure attack. Still, we got some reward for this uh, finding. Okay, um, are there other scenarios where PostScript is used in the web? Um, really, an old technology, older than the web itself. Well, um, the logical step to search for was um, PostScript to PDF conversion websites. And uh, there are not that many of them, but almost all of them are vulnerable to at least um, information disclosure attacks like listing directories. However, you can extend this to image conversion websites in general, because um, many image conversion websites accept EPS as a file format. Now, what is EPS? EPS is encapsulated PostScript. It's actually not an image file format. It's actually plain PostScript in the end. And we uh, recently tested um, the top 100 uh, online image converters, and half of them accepted EPS files. Sometimes we needed to rename GIF to EPS and change the content types, uh, things like that. But in the end, um, half of them accepted EPS files and were vulnerable to at least information disclosure. Okay. You may say, I do not do any conversion on my website. Um, maybe you do thumbnail previews. Maybe you allow users to uh, upload pr profile images and you convert them to 100 pixel JPEG. And then you're doing conversion again. And lots of, site, lots of sites do this. And um, some sites do allow the EPS file type. 
So um, here's a pretty much harmless example. Um, a Dropbox, again, they've sandboxed everything, so uh, I'm allowed uh, to show this example. Um, we uploaded an EPS file and this uh, rendered and executed on the, post, on the Dropbox server, and you can directly see the result um, as an image, as a preview image. Okay, the result of uh, file listing. Okay, now let me come to some uh, countermeasures. Well, actually it's quite hard because um, we attack the uh, standards themselves and um, Adobe is unlikely to update the, um, the PostScript standard. So, um, in the long term, we need to get rid of PostScript. Okay. What else can we do? Well, uh, never, never, ever connect your printer directly to the internet. Um, there was an incident in February where some gray hat hacker printed ASCII art on 160,000 printers around the world, and um, he could have done um, much more evil stuff like trying to physically damage the device or like, um, for example, capture print jobs of uh, other users. So, um, especially in a university context where everyone has a public IP address, make sure that uh, devices that should not be connected from the internet are not connected uh, to the internet. Okay, what else uh, can you do? You can teach your employees to always lock the copy room to make it harder for physical attackers to sneak into it and infect the device, to steal the exams, for example. What else can you do? Uh, administrators should make sure they sandbox the printers into a separate VLAN that is only accessible by a hardened print server. This is currently the only uh, way to actually mitigate um, those attacks. However, it's kind of expensive for an administrator. Uh, printer vendors, well, in the long term, they need to undo some insecure design decisions that have been made decades ago, like PostScript, like proprietary PGL, like um, data and code over the same channel. Um, so um, for some short-term short uh, uh, mitigations, there will be firmware updates, but um, some design decisions um, are really long-term issues. Browser vendors, it's not their fault at all. However, they can actively block cross-site printing attacks, um, block the web attacker by blocking port 9100, which um, they should consider doing. In the long term, however, it's up to the printer vendors to produce secure devices. Okay, let me come to a conclusion. Uh, in this work, um, we performed a systematic analysis of um, network printers and the standards, especially PostScript and PGL. And we were able to show that the standards are pretty much flawed and the implementations are also pretty much flawed. And we applied the attacks to different areas beyond printers, like to websites, for example. There's still some open research, for example, um, as I said, firmware updates are deployed over um, um, the ordinary, as ordinary print jobs, and we collected 1,400 firmware files, and all vendors do it like this. We cannot say yet if um, all vendors use code signing and do it all correctly, or if um, some vendors do not have uh, good protection mechanisms here. Um, adapting the attacks to, to fax would be interesting, using a print shop to control the fax, to control the phone lines in the end, uh, maybe an interesting research area, or adapting the attacks to 3D printing. Okay, let me come to an end. Um, Pred, our tool to uh, pen test printers, is uh, freely available. Um, test it, give me some feedback. And if you're interested in more technical details of the attacks, we have set up a wiki where you can read everything in detail. Okay, do you have any questions? <laughs>